you. On you. This virus is nowhere near the numbers they're saying. The data is wrong. This is corruption beyond belief. How many vaccines have you had? Have you been a good little Nazi? These are the companies that gave us the opioid crisis. Why does anybody think we can trust them? I would not eliminate execution as an appropriate punishment. The logo for Biden, it's not the letter E, it's three straight red lines. It's 666 in Hebrew. This is Satan's last hurrah, because he's really the ruler of this planet. <laughs> Humanless technology, that's what we're talking about when we, when we say 5G kills. We could dismember, we could fall apart. What are you gonna do, arrest me? We were getting ready to win this election. Frankly, we did win this election. You want to create apprehension, hatred, distrust. This is a battle about what the truth actually is. Do you think aliens are still visiting Earth now? Yes. Truth isn't truth. This is unreal. This whole nation's gonna flip on the streets. The struggles politically over the next 10 or 20 years are about what reality we actually live in. What on earth is that? What is it? Big, huge, yellow glow out there. You may be the first television audience to see a flying saucer. Hundreds of reports of strange objects in the sky have been filed with the Air Force. Here on this map are pinpointed locations where some 30 saucers have been sighted and are still unexplained. I was a counterintelligence specialist. I handled counterintelligence operations for the United States Air Force. Back in the uh, early 80s, we had a drone program at Curling Air Force Base, highly classified back then. So people would see these things flying around Curling Air Force Base, and we try to deceive them or fool them to think that what they were seeing was in fact UFOs. And then it seemed to just go together, make a ball, and fly out into that field. We co-opted uh, news organizations, local news media, and we planted stories, and they went along with it because they didn't know the truth. How widespread was this operation? Oh, it was very widespread. It went all the way up through the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff. And then from there, it would go up to the director of Central Intelligence. And then from there, it would go to the White House. It looked like a big cigar shape with light lit from both ends. Do you think the lies you told about UFOs damaged the public's trust in the media? Yes, I'd have to say, unfortunately, it did. Because when the real story came out sometime later, they were deceived by the media, yeah. And just as we started down the woods, well, it went up through the trees. Do you believe it weakened the public's trust in the government as well? Well, yes, the public was deceived by the government. And for all these years, the government is still deceiving the public. If you asked Americans whether they had faith in the government to do the right thing in the mid-1960s, 77% of them say, yes, I've got faith in the government. Ask not what your country can do for you. Ask what you can do for your country. We go through Vietnam. We go through Nixon. That was a classic case where people suddenly realized that the people in the White House were a bunch of crooks. People have got to know 
whether or not their president is a crook. And they had overwhelming evidence of that. Well, I'm not a crook. I've earned everything I've got. You had subsequent phenomena like the Iran-Contra scandal. By their very nature, covert operations or special activities are a lie. By the time we hit the 1980s and Reagan, we're down to about 25% of Americans who say they trust the government. One of Reagan's greatest crises involved the secret sale of weapons to Iran in violation of US policy. We did not repeat, did not trade weapons or anything else for hostages. You then had the Iraq war and all the business about weapons of mass destruction. My colleagues, every statement I make today is backed up by sources, solid sources. These are not assertions. What we're giving you are facts and conclusions based on solid intelligence. I had perpetrated a hoax on the UN Security Council on February 5th, 2003. Today, I feel some grievous remorse over it. Saddam Hussein and his regime have made no effort, no effort, to disarm as required by the international community. Can you walk me through the moment when you realized that mistake? We learned it all during the summer of 2003, after the presentation. Saddam Hussein and his regime are concealing their efforts to produce more weapons of mass destruction. As Powell would walk through the door and tell me with a disconsolate look on his face, another pillar just collapsed. Whether it was the stockpile of chemical and biological weapons or the biological weapons labs. Imagine how I felt the day that uh, they finally came in and said to me, well, you know, we don't have four independent sources for that biological warfare van. It's one guy, and he's loopy, and he's in a German jail, and we've never talked to him. Hello? Throughout the summer, Powell was essentially involved, both publicly and privately, in trying to rationalize what we'd done. It was not a bad war, it was a good war. Saddam Hussein was an evil person, he's gone, that's good. All of it fell apart over the summer. By August, it was all gone. I understood the consequences of that, of that failure. I deeply regret that the information, some of the information, not all of it, some of the information I presented, which was multi-source, was wrong. Can you give examples of other lies the US has told to justify the use of force in the world? The most vivid case in my memory is the war I fought in, the Vietnam conflict. Until peace comes to South Vietnam, the Allied force is pledged to support, protect, and defend a nation fighting for its very life. I was a first lieutenant and a captain in that war and did my best to do what I was supposed to do for my country. But I will tell you that when I found out later, there were several reasons we persisted in that war in Vietnam, and none of them were God, country, apple pie, mom, security, or anything else. They were things like, could Lyndon Baines Johnson get reelected if he cut and ran from Vietnam? It is by Hanoi's choice and not ours and not the rest of the world, that the war continues. How does it make me feel? It makes me feel terrible. It makes me feel like my country has failed me. It makes me feel like my government has failed me. It makes me feel like there is little to be trusted about the US government with regard to the national security state anymore. The doctor is down in a rice paddy, and the troops run to the safety of other craft you get this new class of guardians, neoconservatives emerging out of the wreckage of the Vietnam War in the United States. These politicians are advised by a new class of technical experts in politics in order to manufacture new realities, 
and manufacture political stories. Give me some flames. How about some screaming? Screaming's good. Some sound of screaming. You have highly intelligent press handlers, manipulators. I told lies on behalf of the government, sometimes uh, at my own uh, behest, sometimes because I was asked to do so. The voice of senior Bush advisor Karl Rove. In the case of George W. Bush, it was Karl Rove. The ugly things that people say are at the heart of supposedly the kind of campaigns I run, most of which are, you know, sort of fear-based, smear-based, mudball politics. Karl Rove was one of the most powerful and eminent of the neoconservatives' clique. Thank you again for this extraordinary opportunity. And he very much believed that reality was not something which had passive existence out there. It's something you can actively recreate. Karl Rove probably put it best when he said, uh, when an empire acts, it creates reality. What Rove meant by that specific comment was that Rome, uh, the British Empire at its peak, created reality in the world by the power they wielded, both economic, financial, and military. What we can do is mold and modify and influence the way people see the reality. That can have effects on the reality. That reality can be intervened on by ways in which people are influenced to see themselves and to see one another. Why is it that Americans tolerate their reality being manipulated when presumably they could choose to reject that interference? American people, by and large, are comfortable with that. It brings them profit, it brings them safety and security, it brings them um, a reasonably good life. They simply don't have the intellectual capacity to deal with what being an empire means. So what you are doing, quite deliberately, as a political strategy in order to win elections, is to create enormous divisions, perilous divisions in the long term, in society itself. You want to create apprehension, hatred, distrust. These new realities they try to create always have a dividing line between us and them. They're tearing down our statues. Why? Trust me, the signs are there. And these people are trying to overtake this country and this world, for that matter. Because that is the easiest way of preying on the darkest elements inside the human soul. And we all have dark elements inside us. I overheard Carl say one time outside a Chiefs of Staff meeting, he said, you know, if we milk this terrorist thing right, we can stay in power for a long time. It's purely ruthlessness. The threat uh, is so unknown and so dangerous that the vice president must be taken to an undisclosed location that in the event the president is dead, we have continuity of government. I fear life. I was just talking to a friend of mine about learning how to hunt for deer with a bow and skin it myself. We call it living off the grid, meaning getting a farm somewhere in the middle of nowhere and living out that way. As governments become less genuinely responsive to the needs of their people and increasingly serve a set of interests which are not those of the vast majority of the population, then the notion that they are a force of good or that they are telling the truth similarly recedes. The politics of a manipulative populism is the best way of describing it. Manipulative populism is about constructing false emotions or built anger, hatred, Nearly 180,000 illegal immigrants with criminal records are tonight roaming free to threaten peaceful citizens. If you're out after dark, it's not going to be safe because of these people. 
groups like Black Lives Matter, um, the Communist Party, I mean, they have been very militant agitators. They've been getting in people's faces. Exactly. I mean, it's not safe. We are in a world where what politicians say, what others say, um, are completely detached now from a meaningful underlying reality. This was the largest audience to ever witness an inauguration, period. When Sean Spicer says this is the biggest inauguration, more people have come to this inauguration than the history of inaugurations, part of me is sort of just rolling my eyes and thinking, well, this is just another ridiculous you know, moment. These attempts to lessen the enthusiasm of the inauguration are shameful and wrong. Part of me is also thinking, like, how many people are really, like, buying this right now? Are, are people really buying into this? If we ran a survey right now, what percentage of Trump supporters would say that they saw more people in the picture on the right than in the picture on the left? This was a case where we could show them factual evidence, like photographic evidence, and see if they would still tell us that, you know, something that's not true right before their eyes is true to them. A friend I work with at a survey firm said, let's do it. <laughs> and so the next day, we put out the survey. The results of our experiment showed that 15% of American adults basically said that they saw in the picture that had fewer people in it, they said that's the one that had more people in it. Um, and that was the one from Trump's inauguration. In a way, that's kind of quite astounding because it seems so completely obvious that there were more people present for Obama's inauguration than for Trump's. And the pictures seem completely clear. Now, the interesting question there is, did they say that because they believed it, or did they say it because that's what their side required them to say? What makes it interesting is this 15% wasn't seeing what was there in front of them to be seen. Our imaginations play tricks on us. They often misinterpret what we see and hear. They were not seeing what was true because they were invested in seeing something else. I will faithfully execute. The office of President of the United States. The office of President of the United States. We like to think that facts lead to beliefs. But in fact, beliefs affect how we approach facts. When people already believe something, showing them a fact doesn't necessarily help because they want to look at that fact through the prism of what they already believe. So help me God. What we see here is not simply a cynical form of lying, but real self-deception. Let me give you an example. There's a Marx Brothers scene where Groucho and Chico are trying not to appear in the same time. Come in. Oh, Your Excellency, I'm so glad you've come. I'm glad I come too. The very Marx Brothers kind of scene. And so Groucho hides under the bed. Your Excellency. At one point, Margaret Dumont says to Chico, she says, but I saw you leave with my, my own eyes. And Chico says, yeah, but who do you believe? Me or your own eyes. Oh. And I think that's a comic representation of a, of a potentially very tragic period that we find ourselves in. If people are not willing to believe their own eyes, but believe uh, a, a, a false ideology, then we're not going to be able to meet in reality. Then people came up with lines like, well, there are facts and there are alternative facts. Sean Spicer, our press secretary, gave alternative facts to that. But the point remains Wait a alternative that there's... facts? I think the invention of the notion of alternative facts, when basically those are just patently untrue, they're lies, they're falsehoods, uh, is incredibly corrosive. Historically, politicians would lie and try to get away with it. They wouldn't lie in such a blatant way that everybody could easily fact check it by looking at a simple photo, um, and then go on national TV and defend the lie. Honestly, it looked like a million and a half people, whatever it was, it was. But it went all the way back to the Washington Monument. The classic discussion in Orwell's 1984 about, you know, two plus two is five, 
right, where, um, you know, Winston, the character, is, is, is basically being tortured by, by a representative of Big Brother who's trying to get him to believe that two plus two is five. How many fingers, Winston? Four, five, four, anything you like. Only stop the pain. Stop. <laughs> and Winston has great difficulty believing that two plus two is five, and he has great difficulty believing that for the simple reason that two plus two is not five. Two and two make four. Sometimes, sometimes they're five, sometimes three, or all of them at once. Two plus two will never equal five. You can't construct your own truth in the sense that things are true or false, independent of what you happen to think about. On the other hand, you can intervene and get people to think certain things or, or act in certain ways. That might influence them to, we say, modify and alter the reality uh, that they're living in. Do you think politicians are lying more often now in order to shape a false reality? I think the deeper issue is not that lying is more prevalent. I think lying is more prevalent. But the ease of believing things that are false becomes more prevalent. By the time we get to Obama and then Trump, we're under 15% of Americans who say they trust the government. You know, we want to do everything we can to help you succeed, because if you succeed, then the country succeeds. USA, 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 USA. What's happened in the US is that the Republican Party in particular has started weaponizing that mistrust. We are going to Washington, D.C., and we are going to drain the swamp. So they've taken an old populist trick. The system's against you, but I'm for you. Let me rise above the corrupt system and lead you to a new bright future. Trump has done this to a T. It's what happened with drain the swamp. It's a great phrase, but it's true. He's taken on the government, dismissing much of it as the deep state. Unelected deep state operatives who defy the voters to push their own secret agendas are truly a threat to democracy itself. But his primary enemy has been the media. The media in this country is sold out. There is no more journalism. There is no more First Amendment. It's disgusting what they've done. The media has been lying to us one too many times, and now we just don't believe them anymore. So how did it come to this? One step at a time, one lie at a time. They are the enemy of the people. Now more than ever, you see people going up to reporters and calling them out for their lies that they've told. But again, they've gotten brazen. You can't even reason with these people. They're lying to your face. They know they're lying to your face. All those people just need to shut up. This can be weaponized and manipulated and used by leaders because if they know that they're not going to be held accountable by their own supporters and that there aren't going to be severe electoral consequences for them, then it's more reasonable for them to lie. Trump's a bullshitter. The bullshitter is more dangerous than the liar because the liar at least cares about where the truth is. He will just say whatever it is he thinks will be helpful, regardless of where the truth is. Like you'll go person, woman, man, camera, TV. The fact that people then started to talk about, you know, alternative facts and alternative realities, and we're now living in a post-truth world and so on, what was really going on was the politicization of truth. Truth is truth. About, I, I don't mean to go like. I, no, I it isn't truth. Truth isn't truth. No Trump. No Trump. Trump 2020. This has gone so wide that things that would be counted as completely out of bounds are now being counted as true because there are media and social media that can reinforce that. Where can someone go to, to get a truthful reading on what's really going on here? individuals on the street. So social media and people now with 
these uh, cell phones with video cameras, we can just take video wherever we go and then we can post it online and it, it spreads. There's so many different narratives and messages being pushed on social media. It's easy to create misinformation, conspiracy theories, and fake news, and churn it out really effectively to large volumes of the population. There was a time, I think, in which there was a very idealistic view that social media would be a great liberatory force to kind of suppress narratives and really find out the truth of matters. But there are people who use those technologies intentionally in order to divorce us from what is the truth, in order to impose their own sense of what the truth is for their own political purposes. Trump leveraged social media to spread misinformation at a scale that's probably never been used before, maybe on Earth. He knows how to prey on people's deep insecurities by creating enemies which don't exist, but exist in people's minds. This is the new technology of political warfare. He tells people, don't, don't trust uh, institutions of higher learning. Don't trust universities. Don't trust professors. Don't trust uh, scientists. All of these experts, oh, we need an expert. The experts are terrible. Early on, so this is January 2020, when the very first cases of COVID were spreading from China and then to Italy and then to the US, Trump and prominent elites in the Republican media ecosphere said that this isn't gonna be a big deal. We have it totally under control. We think we have it very well under control. Right now, Louisiana is doubling every three days. Florida is doubling every four in terms of the total cases in those states. We're in very good shape. We pretty much shut it down. This has been a massive exercise in fear mongering. When we have a virus that internationally has a death rate of 0.6%, it's well over 99% survival rate. We've opened up new medical units in order to accommodate for this increased demand of patients who are coming in so ill. What we started doing was that everybody in the hospital was given a COVID diagnosis. The scope of the seriousness of this infection is, is extraordinary. You could go into the hospital and die from a ruptured appendix or from a heart attack or a stroke. And if they tested you or not, they could put COVID on your death certificate. A lot of the rooms are all isolation now because every single patient for the most part is a COVID diagnosis. They're tripling the numbers, they're doubling the numbers, they're lying about the numbers. The testing is faulty. There was a coroner in Washington state who was there to sign a bunch of death certificates. And on a third of the death certificates, it had COVID as the cause of death. And what the real cause of death was gunshot wounds. These are the companies that gave us the opioid crisis. Why does anybody think we can trust them? We do not consent. We will not comply. You're dealing with companies that are serial criminals. The four companies that make all 72 vaccines that are mandated for American children have paid since 2009 over $30 billion in criminal penalties for defrauding regulators for falsifying science, for lying to doctors, blackmailing, bribing doctors and uh, medical regulators, and for killing hundreds of thousands of Americans. What's really happened is we've seen the merger of two forces that are skeptical of traditional knowledge claims. The anti-vax movement historically is a left-wing movement. Is this another eugenics experiment, like Tuskegee or forced sterilization? We simply don't trust you. And why would we? As the Ginny Miskovitz video, Plandemic, 
started getting traction both in left-wing and in right-wing circles, you have this sort of notion that all we can agree on is that nothing the government says about COVID should be believed. With all the best intention, we studied, we learned what we thought was the truth. We had no idea that that the, the data that we were being told was true was not true. Then, for reasons of political expediency, Donald Trump felt like COVID was a personal threat to his presidency. And so what we saw was fascinating and terrifying. I don't wear masks like him. Every time you see him, he's got a mask. He could be speaking 200 feet away from it. He shows up with the biggest mask I've ever seen. Donald Trump himself had said that, you know, if you wear a mask, it's a signal of disloyalty to him. Look at you Fuck fools, you, you got a doily on your face. So what you saw at that phase of the pandemic, you saw lots of viral videos. You're a bunch of wear masks. Woo, losers. Of people in stores or shopping or restaurants who were supporters of Donald Trump who were freaking out when they were asked to wear masks. You're, you're I feel threatened. You're coming close Back to me. Back off! Yes. Threat me again! There's a wildly irrational part of the human psyche, which you can trace back, you know, to the witchcraft crazes of the 17th century. Your children and your children's children will be subjugated! You would hope that people became a lot more rational. <laughs> the last 20 to 30 years, we have had a return to irrational behavior. I will be asked, how many vaccines have you had? Have you been a good little Nazi? There have always been conspiracy theories about pandemics. In Europe, in the mid 14th century, there was a plague known as the Black Death which killed a very large proportion of the population of Europe. Now, that was blamed on the Jews, as many conspiracy theories are. The term conspiracy theory is an interesting term because it was a term that was originally popularized by the CIA in order to discredit people who were saying that the Warren Commission, which was the commission that had investigated my uncle's assassination, were crazy and that, you know, they shouldn't be paid attention to. Today, the Warren Report attempts to unravel the dark twists into which the national tragedy was thrown. I think it's very tempting for people to look for a conspiratorial explanation. Then you can pin it on somebody. The American people are awake and aware to the fact that manipulated viral strains are being waged against the people by corrupt individuals in our government. There you go, boom, people know. Well, I think you have to look at who's behind the entire pandemic propaganda. And it's the people at the World Economic Forum. It's the Davos billionaires that fund it. It's the people at Google and Apple and Amazon, all of the big tech people who have been trillions of dollars richer since this started. So I think that we need to you know, have Bill Gates you know, in front of the judi judicial community here in the Senate and uh, ask him what's his long-term vision for injecting everyone with this vaccine, because clearly it has nothing to do with SARS-CoV-19. Internet users have accused the billionaire of deliberately spreading the virus in order to control the world's population using geolocalized 5G microchips. It's surprising to me how interesting that is, so it spreads far more quickly than the truth. Bill Gates has bragged that his company is going to be able to look at every human being on Earth 24 hours a day. And they're following us in our homes. You know, people think that Alexa works for you. She doesn't. You're working for her. You're telling her your secrets. You're telling her your data. Ultimately, they will be able to punish disobedience. They already do. They're ushering in the transhumanism movement through these vaccines, and they're moving people into robotics and hooking people up to the Google Cloud that then we can be controlled by the Chinese social credit scores. Humanless technologies, okay? So that's what we're talking about when we when we say 5G kills and, and we and we don't want a surveillance state here in the United States of America like they do have in China. And if you speak out too much, like me, and you're not marching lockstep with the propaganda machine, then you get negative social credit scores. 
vaccines are stated to have something in them called hydrogel, which is nanobot nanotechnology. Nanotechnology is being used inside of these vaccines in order to propagate communication with other technologies, essentially turning the human experience into one where we integrate in a transhumanist vision with mechanized technologies uh, or anything that could influence our genetic structure as, a hu as human beings. And you're going to have all of your medical records, all of everything, into this scanning device. The quantum dot tattoo will implant an invisible certificate that can be scanned by authorities using a cell phone app and infrared light. If the scores get to be too low because you're not being a fully engaged, obedient citizen, you can't access your bank account, you can't go to the doctor, you won't be able to travel, you won't be able to get a mortgage, you won't be able to renew your driver's license, you may not be able to get fuel for your car. What do you say to the medical professionals that are just beginning to get a glimpse of the depth to which they have been misled and steered away from their oath to do no harm? I say, forgive yourselves. You can pull on any number of threads and very quickly find yourself in a world not only where someone is trying to sell you a conspiracy theory, but where they're pointing you to dozens of other sources that will confirm that same sort of narrative. Five presidents in the world have been assassinated for speaking out that their countries weren't having any COVID problems at all. There's no question in my mind that conspiracy theory has exacerbated the COVID-19 pandemic. This is psychological warfare. It has nothing to do with our health. It shows up most vividly in my profession, 31 years in the Army, where we have 40% of the Marine Corps refusing to be vaccinated fully a third of the other services refusing to be vaccinated. Um, that's a result of this sort of conspiracy theory, epidemic, if you will, within the pandemic. The people behind the entire pandemic propaganda are stated Satanists. They will tell you that right out when you read things about them. This is Satan's last hurrah. I mean, this is just a big heyday for, you know, because he's really the ruler of this planet. When a disease, a virus, is thought to be a tool of Satan, then there's not really much to discuss. I'm not saying that some of the conspiracy theory isn't based on reality. Some of it is. But most of it is based on ignorance, fear, even apathy. Um, and this is the biggest factor of all, orchestration by unseemly politicians who know it's false, but see how many people believe it and want those people's votes. This man was holding large re-election rallies all throughout the pandemic with, you know, supporters gathering en masse, the super spreader events. You can lie about crowd sizes all you want, no one gets hurt. It doesn't matter, right? It's, it's offensive to some people, but it doesn't matter. There's no consequence to saying you had a bigger crowd or, than someone else. But the moment you're lying about a deadly disease, probably the deadliest pandemic in 100 years, then people will die as a consequence of that lie. Whether or not you got COVID and died at a rally is frankly irrelevant because there is some sort of political spectacle that is occurring here um, that your, your death is serving. CNN projects Joseph R. Biden Jr. is elected the 46th president of the United States, winning the White House and denying President Trump a second term. We were getting ready to win this election. Frankly, we did win this election. We did win this election. The Lord says it is done. The Lord says it is done. This is a fraud on the American public. This is an embarrassment to our country. Everybody in this country knows Donald Trump won this election. Everyone around the world knows he won this election. And if they take the freedom from our vote in this country, this country will never come back again. There was a, a plan.
from a centralized place to execute these various acts of voter fraud, specifically focused on big cities, big cities controlled by Democrats. Victory, 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 victory. We're fighting for our freedom. We're fighting for the United States Constitution. We're fighting for fair elections. For the well-being of this country, the founding fathers, and the left is trying to tear us apart, and we're not going to be torn apart. Because I know you keep reporting falsely that we have no evidence, that we have no specific acts of fraud. That's because the coverage of this has been almost as dishonest as the scheme itself. They are treating us like they did, the, like Nazi Germany did the Jews, okay? We are being silenced, we are being called racists, bigots, you name it, we're being called it. What we are really dealing with here is the massive influence of communist money through Venezuela, Cuba, and likely China in the interference with our elections here in the United States. They got the world thinking nobody likes Donald Trump. Everybody in this country loves Donald Trump. They're trying to shut down our voices and it's not gonna happen. Look at how many people here. Joe Biden couldn't fill a garage. This is a joke and an insult to America. If you know just a little bit of Hebrew, and I recommend you do, the number six is simply a straight line up and down. If you put three of those together, you have 666, which is the mark of the beast. The logo for Biden, it's got three straight red lines in it. It's not the letter E, it's three straight red lines. It's 666 in Hebrew. The Bible is written in Hebrew. So there you have it. Is there a correlation? I'm saying definitively there is. There's plenty of evidence out there already that there's been widespread election fraud. It was done through voting machines. At the end, when they realized, oh my God, he's getting more votes than we even planned our fraud for, they were then in the middle of the night filling out ballots. At 4.30 in the morning, a truck pulled up to the Detroit center where they were count counting ballots. The people thought it was food, so they all ran to the truck. It wasn't food. It was thousands and thousands of ballots. What kind of clear and transparent election has ballots being delivered three and four in the morning? And then they don't allow Republicans or independents to witness the counting in Philadelphia and Detroit, two major cities in swing states. And they're estimated to be a minimum of 60,000, maximum of 100,000. Many of them were triple counted, which means they were put into the counting machine this way. Once, twice, three times. Hundreds of thousands, if not millions, of our ballots were simply thrown in the trash. Now, the software itself was created with so many variables and so many uh, back doors that can be hooked up to the internet or a thumb drive stuck in it or whatever. I mean, Hitler is in his grave right now smiling at the Democratic Party right now, based on what we're seeing right now. This is unreal. One of its most characteristic features it's, is its ability to take a certain percentage of votes from President Trump and flip them to President Biden. If you participated in voter fraud, I'm, say, I'm thinking a minimum of five years in prison. If you conspired and you were a leader, then a minimum of 10 years in prison. That's what the Democrats do. If they don't like the rules, they change them. And they change them at the last minute, they manipulate them, they want to tear down our American system. And if you were a person who was kind of at the top, who for instance maybe ran a voting machine company or was directly involved in switching millions of votes, I, I'm sorry, but I would not eliminate execution as an appropriate punishment. No, there's, there's no evidence. There's been no evidence that these machines have done any of the things that Trump claims, that they've been uh, producing extra votes for Biden or whatever else. And um, there's just no evidence of that. Um, and, you know, lots of political scientists, lots of election scientists spend a lot of time looking at this stuff, and there's just nothing there. Fight for Trump! Fight for Trump! That lie, that idea that Biden stole the 2020 election, is believed by 63% of Republicans in the United States. 70% of Republican House members voted to question those election results in an attempt to overturn them. So we now have one of only two of our political parties largely taken over by a group of people who are putting forward weaponized mistrust, which is to say a lie. 
All of us here today do not want to see our election victory stolen by emboldened radical left Democrats, which is what they're doing, and stolen by the fake news media. We will never concede. It doesn't happen. You don't concede when there's theft involved. There was no insurrection, and to call it an insurrection, in my opinion, is a bold-faced lie. You did your job. You did your job. Now let us do ours. The government did this to us. We were normal, good, law-abiding citizens, and you guys did this to us. Watching the TV footage of those who entered the Capitol and walked through Statuary Hall showed people in an orderly fashion staying between the stanchions and ropes taking videos and pictures. This is a battle, an argument, a dispute, not about the nature of truth. It's an argument about what the truth actually is. You know, if you didn't know the TV footage was a video from January the 6th, you would actually think it was a normal tourist visit. What happens now that we've literally diverged in fact patterns? What happens that we literally now have a group that don't believe in the legitimacy of the presidency? Um, and I don't know the answer. I think we're in a situation where democracies such as they exist are threatened. And one of the reasons that they're threatened, is when you have people who are encouraged to believe things that aren't true uh, in, a, in a deep and radical way, and therefore can't even communicate with people who are trying to understand the truth. This is our country, this is our house. You can't really get the kind of debate that democracy would allow. That may well be how democracy dies, is if we have a sufficiently divergent fact pattern that we can't agree on a single reality to try to collectively govern. This is a huge question for today's America. How do you function as a democracy if your people or a sizable majority of them don't trust your government? It's a huge question. A lot of political scientists believe you can't. And therefore, we could dismember, we could fall apart. If it continues, then I think we're going to see increasing chaos and increasing disruption, uh, and probably increasing violence as well. The struggles politically of the next 10 or 20 years are not about the interpretation of facts. They're about what reality we actually live in. And I think right now, no one is actually trying to change anybody's minds about how to interpret reality we are just at war over what reality itself actually is. He had large eyes, a large head, uh, just slits for his ears, uh, small openings for his nose, small mouth. He was about four something, four eight, four nine. He had suction devices on his fingers. He's scared. He's in this strange society, strange planet. He's captured. He doesn't know what we are. He's scared of us. But we treated him with dignity. And then eventually this military doctor said, you know what, I think I can implant something in his throat. We might be able to teach him English. And he learned English. He learned our language in just a few months. Brilliant guy. I mean, this thing is 1,000 years ahead of us in technology. His brain was larger than ours. Uh, he had an IQ of probably three or 400. And he spoke of hostile aliens. There's hostile races out there that will do harm. And I think that's the message that President Reagan was trying to give the people when he made those, those remarks at the United Nations. Perhaps we need some outside universal threat 
to make us recognize this common bound. I occasionally think how quickly our differences worldwide would vanish if we were facing an alien threat from outside this world. Do you think aliens are still visiting Earth now? Yes. Do you think your work disseminating disinformation on behalf of the US military has hurt you in some ways in now expressing a belief that aliens have in fact landed here? Yeah, sure, yeah. The people that were saying this have never been in intelligence, never been in the military, never worked with the government, never had a security clearance. I didn't randomly go out there and become a maverick and spread disinformation to everybody I could think of. There was a particular purpose, an operation. We call it counterintelligence operation, you call it disinformation. I do understand people saying, how do we believe you when you spread disinformation? Well, I did it because I was told to do it. And I was commended, I got awards for it, um, and I did my job. I did what I was told to do. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and the fun part is they learned English, right? I mean, there are all sorts of things about the world we live in which are completely um, are impossible to explain and incomprehensible, and that's what makes it so wonderful. It's no wonder that people go a bit off beam from time to time. <laughs>